ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. We have a jam-packed video to get into here today. Now, a lot of people have brought this to my attention. This thing where the government's basically trying to allow other firms that are large firms, right? Like a Citadel, like a BlackRock, like a, uh, you know, large hedge funds even. Label them as too big to fail. This has interesting implications so we're gonna go ahead and get into that what i think this means is it good is it bad what do you need to know this has gotten a lot of attention as of just the last couple of hours here this actually was said uh over the weekend and there's going to be a public hearing on this on november 3rd so we definitely want to watch to see what's said you know who potentially would be added to this but i have my take on this that i want to give you here in this video now on top of that we're going to go over the major events happening this week what you need to know about them as well as a lot of fascinating charts that i think you really need to see so let's go ahead and get into it hit the like button subscribe to the channel and source your comments questions or concerns down below in the comment section so i want to start with this uh frank's place posted this over here on x says top U.S. regulators are preparing to discuss plans that would make it easier for the government to stick firms other than banks with the costly, systemically important label. After months of private, privately working on a blueprint for applying the tool the too big to fail tag to a company the treasury department said friday that officials would discuss the effort publicly on November 3rd. The label can carry hefty compliance cost and stepped up scrutiny a systemically important financial institution designation places a firm under direct federal reserve oversight something generally reserved for banks this my friend i think a lot of people have looked at this in the wrong light my friend this could be really positive hear me out for for a minute banks what are they allowed to put their money in? Well, let me show you. So, the banks are really too big to fail entities. Usually, right now, they're only banks. Check it out. Only a small portion of your deposits at a bank are actually held as cash. We already know this. The rest of your money, the majority of the bank's assets, is invested by the bank into vehicles such as consumer or business loans, government bonds, and credit cards. Borrowers have to pay the bank back with interest. Blah, blah, blah. That's important. You're not allowed to own risky speculative things with customer deposits, with customer funds. Okay, so you're not allowed to buy stocks with customer deposits, essentially. But you're allowed to give out loans. You're allowed to buy government bonds. That's why the banking crisis actually happened in March is because banks were flushed with money. They couldn't put it into the markets, right? They had to buy government bonds. They were forced. And then the Fed kept raising rates. They didn't hedge out that risk appropriately. And boom, you have a banking crisis on your hands. Well, let's say for an example... Citadel was put on the too big to fail monitor and they were now deemed kind of like a bank, right? That means that there would be strict, strict rules on what they're allowed to do. The amount of short positions they're allowed to have on any one stock. The duration in which maybe they can hold an asset. Who they can do business with there would be a lot of regulations in which right now they could do whatever the hell they want with anyone they want for any size they want this could limit the potential fraudulent behavior that we're seeing right now yeah sure if something happened and they went kaput well they might they might be bailed out by, by the government but this could actually mean Maybe less shorting of AMC. Less facilitating of shorting of AMC could take place. Now, I'm picking on Citadel here. This goes for other firms as well. This goes maybe for a, you know, Vanguard or, or whoever else that has big short positions on AMC. One, it might be harder to short riskier stocks, like shorting AMC is very risky. It might be harder to actually get your hands on shares to short if you are 
you know, Joe Schmo hedge fund and Citadel is no longer able to touch that. If let's say Jane Street was no longer able to touch that. Sequoia was no longer able to touch that. It would be a little bit harder to get your hands on shares to short of AMC. I could see this very logically being actually a positive thing for AMC. It's more regulation for these guys. Right now, they're just flying under the, you know, umbrella of very little regulation on what and what, you know, what they can and what they can't do as far as facilitating short positions, taking on short positions, buying stock. Right now, nobody's telling Citadel what and what, you know, what they can and what they can't do. If they were deemed as too big to fail, which they probably would be, because after all, they facilitate like 30% of the market trading. You literally cannot have Citadel fail or your financial markets are going to fail. Well, that's going to limit what kind of activity they can do in our markets. I only see that as positive for AMC. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something I am missing here. But generally speaking, I think it makes a lot of sense what I'm saying. Now, again, that comes with the flip side. If they were to fall on hard times and go bankrupt, that would mean the government would bail them out, sure. That's more of an egotistical thing at this point. We all hate Citadel, right? We all hate these guys that have been doing the manipulation. But I don't hate them more than I want to make money. <laughs> Sorry, I want to make money more than I dislike Citadel. Sorry, if you gave me a choice between, you know, me making a billion dollars and every one of you guys making a billion dollars or a million dollars, whoever cares what the number is, or Citadel going bankrupt, I'd rather pay us than watch Citadel go bankrupt. So I, I, I think the argument here is more of one that is just geared towards hate against Citadel, which yeah, again, I'm in that boat with you. But I think it actually is a positive for AMC for actually getting a short squeeze. And there's, you know, two different things that, that needs to be said there, right? You can hate Citadel all you want. I do too. But is this a negative for AMC? I think it's probably a positive for AMC. We obviously don't have all the details. November 3rd, we should get more details. But as of right now, I, I, I can't logically think how more regulation on a Citadel, a Sequoia, or anyone else on what and what, you know, what they can and what they cannot you know, invest in and facilitate trades for, I just don't see how that could be negative for AMC and for a short squeeze. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something, but that's just my opinion. Now, let's get into the major events of this week, and we're going to keep this segment somewhat brief and short. So you have a couple different things. On Monday, you have Apple's event. This will be at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Apple's never done a late night event like this. So there's a lot of weird speculation out there. Maybe it's something to do with their car. Maybe who knows what it is, but it's happening. That's on Monday. On Wednesday, you get the Fed at 2 p.m. And then Fed Jerome Powell at 2.30 p.m. That's going to be one of the biggest catalysts, if not the biggest catalyst of this week. On Thursday, you are going to get Apple earnings. That is going to be probably the second biggest catalyst for our markets. And then on Friday, you're going to get the unemployment rate as well as the non-farm payroll report. So the non-farm payroll report is expected at 188,000 job ads. The unemployment rate is expected at 3.8%. That would be unchanged now for the last three months. If you do get a big drop in the non-farm payroll report, I would imagine the markets would like that a lot. So that's something definitely to be on on your radar, to be watching out for. The rest of this week, as far as earnings, it's going to be a big one, right? SoFi, a big stock that I own tomorrow, pre-market. Uh, Pinterest, Monday after hours. AMD, Tuesday after hours. First Solar, Paycom, Caesars. Wednesday, pre-market. Wayfair, Kraft Heinz, Estee Lauder, uh, Norwegian Cruise Line, TVS, all those guys. Wednesday after hours, PayPal, another one that I own a lot of shares in. Uh, Roku, Qualcomm, Supermicro, Solar Edge, Airbnb, Etsy, Mercado Libre, Elf, Thursday pre market, Palantir, fan favorite right there, Shopify, Eli Lilly, Crocs, another one I own a lot of shares in, Penn National Gaming, so on and so forth. Thursday after hours, again, Apple, Block, DraftKings, uh, Carvana, uh, Fortinet, Starbucks, Coinbase, Cloudflare, and then Friday, another big one I own. Fubo. So this week is going to be a big one for a lot of uh, retail investors and retail money. So 
go ahead and keep that in mind. It's not the whole story, just the, the data, the Fed, Apple earnings. There's a lot of other stocks that will also be reporting earnings. Now, this is a fascinating chart that I would love to bring to your attention. So this is basically showing the average return once the S&P falls into correction territory. So one week after falling into a correction, which would be this upcoming week, you, you normally see a bounce of about 1.5%. Two weeks, three weeks, one month later, you're usually down about 2%. So going from 10%, maybe to 12%. Three months later, you're usually positive, just by a little bit, marginally. Six months later, average return of 3.1%. One year later, you have an average return of 10.1%. So it's, it's clear. Once you actually hit a correction territory, it's usually a pretty good time to start getting into some more positions. I think right now you want to be in the small mid cap stocks. The stocks that have benefited from the Fed raising rates are your large tech names with tens of billions of dollars of cash in the bank. They're just collecting more interest on their money. It's not affecting their business. It's not affecting how many people sign up for Microsoft cloud services or, or affecting how many people buy an iPhone or not, right? But your small and mid-cap stocks, that does affect them a lot. They're not able to refinance debt. They really don't have an option of issuing more debt besides just diluting shareholders. And you know, as we head into 2024, I think Wall Street's going to start looking at that and saying, hey, we don't want to be in the big tech anymore. We want to be in the rest of the markets that has been getting hurt due to the Fed actually raising rates. Now, what's interesting, one year later after correction, you are in the green 80% of the time. So very strong historical precedence there of being green um you know one year after the correction uh so there is that chart now if you take a look at this chart this is a little bit more on the uh bearish side let's go ahead and see if we can actually uh uh pull it up here this one's definitely not a great one the nasdaq 100 it looks like less than 20% of stocks uh, are above their 100-day moving average. Actually, 20 stocks itself, the NASDAQ 100, uh, this chart's 0 to 100. It looks like less than 20 stocks are actually above their 100-day moving average. That is not so great, and it just goes to show the NASDAQ's still up 27%. I mean, why? Your big tech stocks are you know, holding up the markets. That's as, as simple as that. Now, AMC stock in particular, well, I should point this last chart out before we get into AMC a little bit more. This last chart, it's pretty simple. The SPY and the NASDAQ, if you look at the RSI, the relative strength index, you, you pretty much always bounce at the 30 level on the RSI, and that is where you are at right now. So I do expect a bounce from here. I don't know how aggressive, I don't know you know the exact timeline here, but some point this week, I would expect to see a bounce. Currently here in uh, pre-market and futures, NASDAQ's up about a half of 1%. The S&P is up about a third of 1%. The Dow is up 0.22%. So it does look like Monday might start off the week on a green note, probably due to that technical factor that is, you know, essentially saying that we historically bounce at the RSI at the 30 level. And that's probably what's going to happen again. Now, if you take a look at AMC stock, AMC stock has been doing phenomenal. Even on um, Friday, where the S&P was down a half of 1%, AMC stock was down 1% in regular trading. You rose about 1.5% in after hours. I do think you're going to stay off of that $7 low. I think AMC stock, once liquidity flows back into our markets, we made a whole video on that in the last video. Check that out if you guys have not done so already. Once liquidity actually comes back into our into our markets, AMC stock is going to rally big time from there. Now, I think it's more than likely we're going to see AMC stock break above that 50-day moving average at $10.69 per share. Once you break above that 50-day moving average, you open the door up to a rise as high as $25 per share. And I do think as more money flows into small and mid-cap stocks, that's probably going to happen. And I think it could happen sooner than a lot of people to expect. So that's going to do it for this video. Just wanted to make you guys this you know, little brief video, go over a couple different topics. If you guys like this video, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know down below in the comment section. In the meantime, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.